And welcome to The Renegade Economist with your host, Carl Fitzgerald. This week, we have a exciting interview with Senator Scott Ludlam from the Greens. So we're going to uh, jump straight into that here on uh, 3CR's Renegade Economist, where we're constantly bringing you the news on how we can wind back the influence of uh, vested interests, those rent seekers claiming money in their sleep. And it's great to see the uh, current Australian election campaign alive with conversation about negative gearing and capital gains tax. So Scott Ludlam is the housing spokesperson for the Greens. Let's roll on over to the interview. We're joined this week by Senator Scott Ludlam from the Australian Green Party. The internet sensation is joining us here on The Renegade Economist. So, Scott, great to have you on the show again. Good morning. And part of the question we have rolling through Australian politics is this challenge to property interests and with the negative gearing and capital gains tax reforms both the Greens and the ALP have announced. Uh, for the first time, really, uh, the property lobby is on the back foot and uh, the people have smelt what's going on in that uh, negative gearing is in effect a, a property investor's uh, form of welfare. How do you see negative gearing and, and help people understand these unfair advantages? I think the trick is to demystify it and I'm really pleased that for the first time, certainly in my experience in this work, housing affordability and subsidies for speculative investment are actually in the political frame for the first time. I can't remember ever this being part of mainstream debate. And so the way that we've been explaining it really is to just try and simplify and demystify it. This is not rocket science at all. It's what amounts to a $7 billion a year subsidy for people speculating on the property market. And I have no problem with people buying investment properties, but I don't think low-income taxpayers should be picking up the tab and subsidising them. So between negative gearing and capital gains tax, the, the two instruments obviously work very closely together, you've effectively got subsidies that, that amount to $7 billion a year going to people to, to buy investment properties. It's a huge advantage and it helps them to be able to outbid first home buyers because they recognise they will be receiving a tax write-off in the short term to overcome some of the, uh, the, the extra mortgage costs they're incurring and outbidding um, uh, genuine home buyers. And, and then in the long run, they get that handy capital gains tax uh, windfall. It's immense, these advantages. And so can you explain the difference between the ALP and green reforms in terms of negative gearing and the all-important capital gains tax discount? Yeah, well, we'd been studying it for a while and we weren't able to get the Labor Party, when they were in government for six years, to budget at all. Couldn't even get them to talk about it. Couldn't get Treasury to model the impacts of negative gearing on the economy uh, or on the budget bottom line. But... Uh, last year, about this time last year, we announced that we would phase out negative gearing completely, that we just wanted it gone, that we would grandfather it in for uh, people who have existing properties. And that was principally to um, protect those, for example, who might have a single investment property, that that's their retirement income. And there are a lot of people on that basis where we figured we will, we'll phase it out so it's not going to be legal to do it anymore. But those particularly older people who'd structured their financial affairs that way, we wouldn't penalise because I think negative gearing is wrong, but it has been legal uh, up until now and people have been advised to structure their tax affairs that way. So that was the first thing, phase negative gearing out so that it's gone and the Parliamentary Budget Office estimated that within about 10 years, it would be almost completely washed out of the system and, and it wouldn't exist anymore. A couple of months later, we announced that we would phase out capital gains tax exemptions entirely. We, we think the 50% discount should be zeroed. And we proposed, again, to prevent a shock in the market, to step it down 10% per year until it's gone, and that both of those initiatives should be effective immediately. So what you don't want to do is give the market, uh, or give, give investors a window of a year or so, which unfortunately is what the Labor Party are proposing, which is going to completely distort behaviour. You get a stampede into the market or you get panic selling or panic buying and it's, it becomes quite messy on the advice that we took. So what the Labor Party has done is they've kind of come halfway on both. So they're proposing to, to 
ramp the capital gains tax exemption down to 25% from 50, and they've proposed to leave negative gearing in the system, but only for new properties, new build. I mean, there's some merit in that. We had that costed and then figured uh, if we think that this policy instrument is wrong, that it's a distortion and that it's unfair, then it should go. And the other thing that the Labor Party did was propose quite long lead times before these things set in. And our advice really is that that can actually distort the market. So they've come halfway. Uh, I think it's an interesting debate and it's a legitimate position to go halfway. Uh, it certainly progresses the debate more than the government, which is simply digging its heels in. So in the past, you've asked some really good questions on notice through the various uh, economics committees you're involved in on negative gearing and the ability to abuse the tax write-off. Uh, what happens in terms of the oversight of negative gearing? Is any particular government agency able to see whether uh, a property is being rented out at market rates or for how long they can, can write off uh, these incredible windfall gains for? No, there's nothing of the sort. As far as I'm aware, it's it's a complete free-for-all. I don't think any, anything exists. And if it did, it's going. you're going to need to be micromanaging people's investments. I think it's just better that we take those, that we take these concessions off the table entirely rather than trying to micromanage them. Again, one of the things that we contemplated doing was saying, all right, you can negatively gear property as long as it's 20% below market rate or that we would severely curtail the list of, of things that could be negatively geared or rental losses that could be negatively geared and restrict it to, to you know, green improvements to the property, solar or water or insulation or take your pick. And again, figured that the, the scale of the bureaucracy that you're going to need uh, and the costs, I suppose, the overheads of maintaining that kind of system will again only be perpetuating a policy instrument that we think is bent completely out of shape. So we considered all of those options, we took our time and then ultimately figured we would keep it simple. Negative gearing, capital gains, tax concessions should go and we should uh, be investing in supply and we should be also looking at other, you know, other questions around supply. The work that you guys have done on, on vacancies, on speculative vacancies and on the huge number of properties that are just sitting empty is another angle to the supply question that I just don't think gets enough airtime. Yes, well, the phone just keeps ringing about that report. Uh, it was on ABC Sydney Radio this week discussing it. But, Scott, what advice can you um, give us? Because we've tried Kelly O'Dwyer's office uh, to try and get her to put pressure on the ABS to more formally investigate the role of speculative vacancies. The, the vacancy rates that are advertised in the press only include those properties that are up for rent, but as we keep showing, the capital gains are so great that more and more investors are saying, why bother renting them out? How do you think that um, campaign angle could evolve? Oh, I just feel a bit awkward giving campaign advice to an organisation that's kind of single-handedly put that issue on the map. and Nobody was talking about that before. Uh, I feel like we've got to make sure that when we're talking about capital gains tax, that that is one of the reasons for taking it off the table, that those exemptions basically mean you get this big windfall on sale of the asset and that that's making it much less interesting in some circumstances to actually get it tenanted with all of the, all of the hassle that that can entail. So I feel like keeping it on the, on the boil is going to involve reminding people that that's one of the perverse impacts of capital gains tax exemption, but also look at some of the other instruments that are playing their part. So, for example... Uh, land land taxes. There's no nationally uniform scheme for levying land taxes on property, and so uh, it it means that those properties that are empty uh, effectively aren't being taxed. There's no kind of holding costs for, for hanging on to those things. So that is one example of of where we could twin up um, the stamp duty regime, which nobody likes and nobody supports, but the states are simply hooked on that revenue. Swapping that out for, for, for land taxes across the country would, again, be one way, uh, I think, of making it less attractive to hold an empty property. And then the other tier, I guess, of local government, so if you've gone from federal to state to local, uh, is there are a couple of examples around the place where local councils have tried to, to hike rates on properties that are empty, whether it be for residential or commercial properties. There's a ton of things that can be done, and they all point in the same direction, is that you can't legally force 
somebody who holds a property to let it out and to get a tenant in there, but you can tilt the table. You can tilt the incentive table in positive ways to make it more appealing for, for tenants to get into places. It's just so frustrating to see that uh, first home buyers, anyone can take out a 40 or even a 50 year mortgage today in Australia. What are the Greens doing about uh, correcting this mistake that uh, it's a good thing for people to be in debt for their entire working life? Look, it's an excellent question. I suppose in the short term, we have to work out how to how to create more affordable properties so that people aren't having to take on these catastrophic debts. It's it's part of a function. I mean, prudential regulation is one part of it. Lending money to people who who either can't afford it or these incredibly long term and what will effectively become intergenerational mortgages. That's one part of it. And the other question that I suppose is front and centre is how the hell did property get so expensive? How did it race so far outstripping? wages growth over the last 15 or 20 years that such mortgages are actually even under consideration. So I think probably I'd throw you to some of the work that Pete Wish Wilson is doing on on banking sector reform. From my point of view on housing affordability, that's 90% of the problem that people are having to take on these crushing mortgages because there's simply nothing on the market that's affordable. The rise of the Greens continues uh, both locally and internationally and I'm interested in the strategies the Labor movement is um, is taking to... Uh, they're pursuing this failed strategy of attacking the Greens who are clear political allies on a day-to-day basis in Parliament. Do you see a, ma- a maturation in their strategy towards leading a strong progressive bloc? I think it's a really mixed picture, to be honest, and sometimes it's a mistake to treat the trade union movement as though it's a unified bloc, because clearly it's not. There are a lot of different alignments and affiliations and, and views within the union movement that um, can express in different ways, even the distinction between those that are directly affiliated with the Labor Party and those that are more independent. It's rare for uh, a union of any kind to outright endorse the Greens, and I think that, you know, it's a hundred year uh, allegiance to the Labor Party does run pretty deep for uh, for many trade unions. In a way, a watershed moment was the 2013 campaign when the National Tertiary Education Unit, a union, effectively came out and endorsed the Greens. If you could recall, we were campaigning against the Labor Party's higher education cuts at the time. But that's, uh, you know, there are, there are sort of those. Uh, those opportunities that come forward and otherwise we've worked quite closely over the years with the blue collar unions uh, and uh, you know on industrial issues when they're under attack by entities like the Australian Building and Corruption Commission we would get in the fray when that was happening but then on the other side of the ledger I suppose the a handful of the unions and including the ACTU unfortunately played something of a spoiler role during the Labor Party's collapse over so Senate voting reform a couple of months back and you know, I think some of what they got up to at that stage was dramatically counterproductive. So it's something of a mixed bag. Uh, it's not, you know, we do have strong support and we have a lot of Greens members who are union members and union organisers. So I think in a way it is maturing to a degree, but it's sometimes it's, it's a few steps forward and a few steps back. Well, Scott Ludlam, uh, well done for continuing the push against uh, the vested interests who uh, harass the public interest wherever they can. Uh, best of luck uh, from us here at the Renegade Economist in the upcoming election. Good on you, Carl. Thanks so much. Excellent, Scott. I'm just feeling I'm just feeling optimistic because at least there's a fight now, and there never was. I feel like we've been shouting into the void about this for ten years, mm. and now there's a fight. So at least it's that's why I'm a bit chipper. There we have Senator Scott Ludlam, a bit chipper about the state of housing affordability policy with uh, more talk about negative gearing and capital gains tax reform. Check out his excellent work at scott-ludlam.greensmps.org.au, scott-ludlam at greensmps.org.au. Or on Twitter, Facebook, he's everywhere and I'm sure uh, uh, going to cause a few laughs on um, on ABC's uh, Kitchen Cabinet coming up soon. So, uh, yeah, great that he threw a few props our way on our work in uh, on, on vacant properties and came to the same conclusions many of my colleagues have in that uh, our vacancy report is great at pointing at the problem, uh, the... the, the uh, 
thorough uh, measurement of vacant property is a huge challenge and maybe uh, we're just better off in enacting a, a broad-based land tax to replace stamp duties uh, and deter the incredible speculative profits that are out there. Um, I did some... Uh, 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 an interview on ABC Radio this week, as I mentioned, and uh, did the numbers on what's going on up in Sydney. And of the $525 billion increase in land values last year here in Australia that I often talk about, $301 billion of that increase happened in Sydney. And when you add that to the $137 odd billion here in Melbourne, uh, 81% of the uh, the economic rents of the capital gains of land uh, was uh, enjoyed by property owners in uh, Sydney and Melbourne. So uh, are we lucky or what? Did we really deserve to uh, claim uh, windfall gains of uh, circa $440 billion between uh, the two capital cities? And what are those people uh, living in uh, the far-flung corners of this great white brown land think about those sort of disparities? They are the big questions we ask here on 3CR's Renegade Economist each and every week. So uh, it's been another huge week at our Prosper Australia offices. On Monday night, Catherine Cashmore was on Channel 9 News discussing the 80,000 apartments that are going to be thrown onto the Melbourne property market over the next year or two and and compared that to the 80,000 properties uh, that are vacant already. And it raises an interesting question as more and more uh, scaremongering comes through the press that we have an apartment glut and there's going to be an oversupply and we're building the wrong sort of apartments is is one of the critiques that Catherine Cashmore brings which is a valid one but the one I want us to start raising more and more questions over is uh, why shouldn't property prices be falling apartment prices be falling when we've given such extensive rezoning to our CBD I was looking over the Docklands last night with my sisters and uh, it's just staggering how much the skyline has changed over the last couple of years. And uh, uh, it's, it's hard to recognise our city by the, the number of new skyscrapers that have come through. But has it done anything for affordability? No, of course. And so there needs to be a return on, um, uh, on this public uh, policy what sort of return on investment does the public interest receive for changing the city's skyline? We should be demanding no less than a 20% fall in apartment prices to meet some of the long-term fundamentals that would still probably be skew if We'd still need two income earners dedicating over 30% of their money to, to meet prices uh, 20% lower than what we're seeing at the moment. So <clears throat> they're big issues and it's part of changing this meme surrounding uh, the, the never-ending news cycle that rising property prices are good for everyone. Well, of course, we keep saying uh, they really only benefit the banksters and uh, those lucky property speculators. This morning's uh, Australian Financial Review had uh, a number of... Um, uh, a smarmy looking property investors who were, were from the BRW Young Rich list, but who this year have jumped into the BRW Rich 200 list. Um, none less than Jonathan Hellenen, who uh, looks every bit the male model, very lucky fellow to uh, have amassed a huge fortune. Uh, the, the leader of this new brat pack of property uh, developers. Uh, with $536 million from his uh, position in the Perth apartment market is, um, uh, what's his name, Blackburn. So, uh, yeah, Paul Blackburn, his one. Tim Gurner's the youngest at age 34. He has a $460 million fortune he's riding. And, uh, yeah, Jonathan Hellenin's in there as well. So these gents have been extremely lucky to have timed their run during a once-in-a-century property bubble that's been enhanced by not only negative gearing and capital gains tax, 
But uh, interest-only loans, we've got self-managed super funds able to invest in uh, real estate for the first time since 2010. Not only invest in it, but borrow against those investments to leverage even further into debt. So everyone's up to their eyeballs in debt. We are the most uh, indebted per capita nation on the planet. And we're told that's a good thing and you should go out and get further in debt. 40, 50 year mortgages are, are the answer for some, but uh, for those of us who have been locked out of the property market, uh, uh, trying to survive on part time work, it must be increasingly frustrating trying to figure out a way forward. So, uh, yeah, the, the question I wanted to um, discuss uh, is uh, the difference between capital gains tax and negative gearing. Uh, which reform would be more important if uh, a uh, ALP Greens alliance did get into power after this election? Uh, would the Labor government hold strong in the face of, uh, of uh, uh, no doubt, uh, a continuing vested interest campaign by the property lobby to uh, ensure they can continue earning free money in their sleep? Well... Some of us say that, look, they could actually avoid reforming negative gearing and just go straight for the jugular and remove the capital gains tax discount, which John Howard gave uh, to the Housing Industry of Australia under um, sustained lobbying when the GST was introduced around 2000. So um, it was a bit of a handback because uh, the HIA had lobbied heavily to say, look, putting the GST on building products is going to make housing more unaffordable. And as we see on graph after graph on macrobusiness.com.au, uh, the construction costs have been stable pre-GST, um, pre the millennium. Uh, it's been the rising value of land that has been uh, the big cost to Australia's uh, uh, housing indebtedness. So by falling for this uh, argument that uh, the taxation of uh, the timber and, and plumbing fittings needed for our homes, uh, they should get a capital gains tax discount of 50%. That meant that uh, essentially uh, the, the land bubble could grow to, to twice what it could have been twice what, what, it, what it would have been if the capital gains tax had stayed as it was. So uh, it's probably tripled, if not quadrupled, since that point in time. And uh, it's great to see that uh, despite the shortcomings of the ALP, as uh, Ludlam just pointed out, uh, that they are willing to take that on. So hopefully uh, we can recognise that uh, some of these people who are amassing, you know, $460 million fortunes in barely a decade, the reward for such effort is not commensurate with uh, uh, the the efforts undertaken. So uh, uh, is it a great skill building houses? Sure, there's some skill to it, but the real skill is being able to buy at the right time and uh, snap up that location and then get the golden pen tick, the rezoning that Paul Little enjoyed in uh, Fisherman's Bend recently, took home $40 million dollars through one property transaction. He's probably got five or six on the go at the same time. So uh, that's how some of these people uh, really boom through these rich lists. So the capital gains tax, whilst we could uh, uh, cut or totally remove that tax discount, uh, it's still secondary when it comes to uh, tax efficiency because if you recognise that selling your family home, you're going to uh, uh, basically have to pay half of the capital gains to government, uh, you're going to uh, avoid doing that, aren't you? Because you don't want to pay so much tax. So that will mean more people will stay in big, rashly old homes so there might be just one or two people living in a four-bedroom home. Meanwhile, uh, young income earners are having to spend uh, an hour commuting to work to and from past all these rattly empty homes. So uh, that's why a yearly land tax is a fairer system because in effect it acts as a counterweight to mortgage debt. 
We essentially pay similar amounts of money, but the decision is whether we want to uh, pay the banks uh, thousands of dollars in interest and line their uh, billion dollar uh, windfall profits each year or whether we want to um, channel that payment away from the banking system and use it to give us uh, lower mortgage costs, lower income taxes, and lower cost of goods. How does that all work out? How do we get a three-for-one bonus there? Well, this $525 billion increase in Australian land prices over the last financial year is about $8 billion more than the entire cost of running all three levels of government. So if we could channel the entire bubble away from uh, property owners, uh, it would be an interesting political situation, wouldn't it? But that's the argument we've been pushing for over 100 years. We're celebrating our 125th year this uh, September the 2nd, so uh, it's a long-term movement that uh, really asks this question on whether you created that land and uh, did you actually contribute or uh, yeah, did you contribute to the local services that make that location so amenable? Most people say, well, I wasn't around when that hospital was built and probably don't know um, much about that school either. Well, that's the sort of situation that we need to recognise that uh, the community is paid for all of these infrastructure you know, these foundational uh, tools of society and, and we should be paying something back to government to say thanks for that according to the benefits we receive. And those benefits are quantified in land prices. And so I threw out a tweet today that um, your possible tax cut is instead their ride to riches. The jump in land values has rock starred these lucky few into the BRW rich list. And so that's essentially what I'm saying is that uh, by ignoring this, uh, we are having to pay more taxes that allows a, a certain lucky few to become wealthier and wealthier as uh, many of us are stuck uh, in a lifetime of uh, uh, renting our property. So tomorrow night we have Dr. Terry Dwyer, former uh, economist in Department of Prime Minister and Cabinet, He's presenting land is the key to ending bad taxes at our Prosper Australia Hardware Lane offices. So check out prosper.org.au to uh, come and listen to uh, one of Australia's leading experts on uh, this whole gamut of how to set up a tax system that uh, is f fair, efficient and everyone is uh, uh, f basically, you can't avoid paying your fair share back to the community. So my name's Carl Fitzgerald. Uh, I thank you very much for listening to 3CR. I must uh, give a quick announcement that in mid-June, I'm doing a uh, an amazing thing, taking six months and taking my family around the country. We're doing the All the Good Things tour of Australia, and uh, I'm looking forward to filming up quite a few hot spots and if anyone's interested in a presentation on these sort of issues certainly get in touch via renegades at earthsharing.org.au i look forward to bringing you many shows on the road